Good evening, everyone. We're just waiting for the arrival of more of our members of the Board of Education before we can get the meeting underway, as it looks like I'm the only person here from the BOE right now. So bear with us. Okay, it looks like five of us are here as members of the Board of Education. I'm just waiting for one more person to arrive so we can get underway. Okay, it looks like we have six members of the Board of Education here. So I'd like to call to order the Board of Education meeting for April 20th, 2021. Welcome everyone. Please note that Board President Lauren Berman is unable to join us this evening. I'd like to begin the meeting by turning it over to Dr. Henning Piedmont to begin with announcements, please. Thank you so much. Um, so a few announcements to share with you uh, this evening. Um, uh, first, I'd like to congratulate and thank the students um, of Hastings who participated in Sunday's um, Asian American and Pacific Islander vi uh, vigil uh, at Draper Park. They did such a great job in terms of their of, of you know, the roles that they played in organizing as well as speaking. Uh, so I wanted to publicly uh, recognize and, and thank them for for for, for um, being, you know, uh, engaged in civic activity and uh, raising awareness around uh, this very important issue of uh, anti-Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, violence. Um, uh, a few other announcements to bring to your attention. Um, on uh, Wednesday, tomorrow, the policy committee will be meeting uh, at 3 p.m. And you can find the link to that information on our website. Um, on Friday, the 23rd, the Hastings High School Musical will be from 7 to 9 p.m. On Tuesday, April 27th, the Hillside Assistive Technology uh, Night for Parents will take place at 7.30 p.m. On Wednesday, April 28th, there will be a superintendent's chat for, at 3.30. Um, all um, community members, parents are invited. Uh, on Tuesday, May 4th, we're already talking about May, there is a student uh, board liaison meeting uh, that starts at 7.30 a.m. On Also on Tuesday, a few things on, on Tuesday, May 4th, uh, New York State Math Exam Session 1 uh, for grades uh, 3 through 8 will take place from 8 a.m. until 11 uh, a.m. Also on that Tuesday, um, the Farragut Middle School PTSA meeting will take place at 6.30 p.m. And finally, on Tuesday, May 4th, it's our budget hearing, uh, which will be at 7.30 p.m. So thank you so much.
Okay, moving over to administrative comments. Do we have anything from you, Ms. Szymanski? Yes, good evening, everyone. First, some congratulations are in order. Congratulations to Caleb Painter, who has been selected as a winner of the National Merit $2,500 scholarship. Caleb will be attending Harvard University this fall. Congratulations, Caleb. Next, we have an IXL pilot. I've been working together with IXL, the administrative team, the department chairpersons and teachers to develop a pilot program to explore IXL as a potential district-wide diagnostic screening tool. Ideally, this will be able to be articulated as a resource K-12, and that would support tracking students across grades and buildings while simultaneously strengthening our ability to support students with a resource that provides both formative data and intervention and extension learning activities. In the area of writing, the third grade team has been working on creating teaching tools to support explicit writing instruction in any setting. The focus for recent work with the kindergarten team was on supporting writers to attend to letter sound relationships, spelling patterns, and high frequency words as they add text to the page. Additionally, Gravity Goldberg recently met with Hillside Writing Committee members, and this session focused on developing a common lens for looking at students' narrative writing and designing a common learning progression template. This template will be used for the purpose of understanding developmental progressions, identifying areas for student assessment, and determining next steps for differentiated instruction. And the recent work of the K-12 Mathematics Committee was centered on the creation of indicators that capture the group's shared vision around the nature of mathematics learning and also instructional approaches to promote mathematics learning that are aspirational for the district. The middle school resource selection work continues to be in motion. We actually met earlier today. And that work is being anchored by the indicators that were created by this committee. So thank you. I see Sabine is here. So if she'd like to provide us with a student update, that'd be most appreciated. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Varsity swim and volleyball have sectional playoffs this week. The first day of spring sports was yesterday. The NAHS and Amnesty International Spring Art Blast is Thursday, April 29th at 7 p.m. Student art will be auctioned off to raise money for a medical fund and information is in the Hastings Daily. AP exams are in a few weeks. And finally, some student perspectives from this past week. Going back in person has been weird and tiring and crazy and fun. A lot of people found the first week to be draining, but at the same time, we're happy to be with everyone and have a more normal class dynamic. Thank you. Welcome back to Sabine and to all of our students. I know that everybody is happy to have that positive energy coursing through the halls once again. So it really has been a, a labor of love. I know from everybody from top to bottom in the district. So I'm glad you guys have made it this far. Just, you gotta just pack it in these last few months. Um, Today, we, uh, we actually have a, an item that's not included on the agenda, but that we wanted to include in order to provide some communication to the uh, community. And that is that I'm gonna turn over the program to Allison Andrus so that she can provide an update on our interim superintendent search. Allison. Oh, it, I think Jeremy, did you, you were gonna step in and do yes. that? Yes, I'll do this one. Uh, all right, together, so, good, Jeremy. But he's go ahead and, and all right, go yeah. ahead. Thank you. I will. Uh, Allison has been doing a lot of the work, so uh, I am giving the update for other reasons. But we did want to just uh, share with the community uh, where we're at, and the, you know the simple truth. It'll be a little bit brief, but our district and our community is well aware, you know, that we've had multiple superintendent and multiple interim superintendent searches recently so we did want it to be uh you know understood that this and previous uh, searches we it's a smaller search that the board is conducting and we are vetting recommendations from uh executive search firms who know our district from previous years our council and current administrators who are sharing possible names so we are uh, 
We are comfortable and happy. Uh, we are currently moving forward with four interested candidates. Our first discussions are happening uh, later this week. You uh, get some notices of executive sessions related to personnel. And sometimes that quite obviously could be a discussion with a candidate that uh, has expressed interest with us. In general, we are looking for an interim search candidate. We are getting uh, experienced candidates who can step in. These are often retired previous superintendents, although though our search did include uh, a wider variety of candidates. So timing wise, uh, this week, next week, we really start moving forward. But this is, a, this is a search that could easily go into May. We're respectful of our candidates' time, and we will keep uh, updating the community as we move forward. Thank you, Sylvia. Thanks for that summation. OK, we're going to move over to our first public comment section. Um, our first public comment period is open relating to items on this evening's board agenda. Comments are limited to three minutes in duration. Tonight, we will allocate an additional 15 minutes to reflect an uptick in emails on the subject of the budget. Any who are not accommodated in the time frame will be heard in the second public comment period. Please advise us if you're a resident of Hastings on Hudson and wait for our district clerk, Ms. De La Barrera, to tell, us, tell you it's your turn to share your comment. Thank you. Lisa Edgar Litvin, Litvin. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, I'm Lisa Litvin and I live in Hastings. Uh, I'm asking, I'm here tonight to ask you to make the diversity coordinator position full time, um, as had been your plan up until just a week ago. There are many reasons, but for time's sake, I'll focus on just one um, that you may not be aware of, and that is academic performance. While our district boasts excellent state data on student performance, that excellence sadly doesn't reach all our students, um, especially our students of color. As an example, if you look at the proficiency rates for Hastings students on state ELA tests, um, it, it's rather disturbing. The most recent online complete data with subcategories shows that uh, on the ELA test, the, uh, and, and 2018 was the most recent year, 79% of our white students ranked as proficient. 75% of our Asian students did. 57% of our Hispanic students did, and only 27% of our Black students did. Those numbers, again, were 79% proficiency for white, 75 for Asian, 57 for Hispanic, 27 for Black. These are the terms the state uses. These numbers should shock you, um, and the state math numbers were similar. These are examples of what we call achievement gaps, and that is when subgroups don't perform as well as their white peers by significant amounts. And I know that many districts show achievement gaps and I'm not, I'm not blaming us, um, but some are showing smaller gaps than we have in Hastings. And that, that's what we have to strive for. As an example, our neighbors in Ardsley, uh, there was a very small achievement gap with respect to Hispanic students. There, the white students were 70% proficient on the state ELA test and Hispanic tests were 65% proficient. That's a 5% gap as opposed to Hastings where we had over a 20% gap. Now, what causes these differences? What, what are some towns doing, you know, the more successful towns doing that we could do? To what degree does systematic racism play a role? In my opinion, it plays a huge amount. A full-time diversity director could start to address the issue of these achievement gaps, talking about addressing hiring staff of color, retaining staff of color, which is something we've had problems with, supports for children of color, affinity groups for staff, relevant and sensitive curriculum, proper use of Title I money, et cetera, all of which directly impact student achievement. And I wanna add and acknowledge that the district has been doing great work and has been doing so much to lead in many ways. Our courageous conversations are being replicated because of how effective they've been. And they were created by Hastings teachers, including our diversity coordinator, Janice Mateo Toledo. Think about what could happen if she were full-time. We have a chance now to really make a difference for kids who don't often get that help. As a final statement, I think at this juncture, should you make this position full-time, I think it would be appropriate to change the title to director instead of coordinator to reflect its importance, its full-time designation, and the groundbreaking work that's been happening because of our director, a diversity coordinator, Janice Mateo Toledo. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay. Next, I have um, Amy Nichols. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to just thank the board members, administrators, um, and Maureen Caraballo for all of your work on the budget. Um, I understand we are in a difficult situation. In fact, I actually don't really understand it. So I do appreciate you all doing that work. I know that it is really quite difficult. Um, and I really, I, I do wanna echo a lot of um, what the earlier comment was sharing and advocating for um, in making our district coordinator full-time, um, even, even given um, the, the limitations that we have financially currently. Um, I do understand that this position is appreciated by this community, but I fear that it's being conceptualized more as like a luxury instead of really fulfilling serious needs in areas that have been lacking forever, really, and, and are quite urgent. Um, and I wanna acknowledge the work Ms. Mateo Toledo has done um, on, her, on a part-time basis, which is exceptional, um, and, and also certainly others in our community, like the Race Matters Committee and, and many, many other. Uh, members of our of our district have moved this forward in really really meaningful ways but um i do believe that there are significant costs involved in delaying full resources that a position like this really requires um and i'm thinking of costs um certainly looking at the news and seeing what um you know the world that our children are inheriting uh news of racist violence anti-lgbtq discrimination is really relentless and yet also on a, on a local level in our own school hallways, um, casual microaggressions continue to occur. We need significant guidance on you know, future handling of curriculum, dealing with uh, race and racism. And as the previous commenter said, struggles to attract and retain faculty and staff of color, which is, is something that is, is a serious issue um, in our district. And so these are costs that are not gonna show up in our budget as line items, but they're very, very real. And um, as, I, as I mentioned in my earlier letter to the board, this is, this is not just one person's work. This is the work of our entire community. Um, but in order for us to be truly focused and, and truly effective, we need the guidance, um, the leadership and the vision of our district coordinator. And we are so incredibly fortunate to have a treasure in Ms. Mateo Toledo. And so I really hope that this board and um, you know, this community can, um, can find a way to make this happen in our budget. Um, and, and do so without cutting any personnel. And I really appreciate you taking the time um, to hear this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Caitlin Chang. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. My name is Caitlin Chang. I'm a Hastings resident and parent to two Hillside students. In the winter of 2019, my friend lent me her copy of the race issue of the buzzer. After reading it, I wanted to better understand the racial climate in our schools. So I started researching. I made an informal timeline of racist incidents in our schools and the efforts made to address them. This past summer, I collected students and staff of color's words around their experiences in Hastings schools, at rallies, from articles, et cetera. I read and reread their words. The risk inherent in sharing a negative racialized experience in a majority white setting became clear to me. I was thankful for their emotional labor and intent on not letting it be for nothing. I promised myself that if I felt the voices of students of color and staff were not being considered enough, I would amplify their voices. I was delighted to learn of the proposed expansion of Ms. Mateo Toledo's position. However, when I watched the April 7th and 12th EOE meetings, the gravity of the financial situation became clear and my own clarity felt shaken. I thought of the members of the board. You each have integrity, are caring, and understand the competing demands in the district far better than I do. I returned to the documents I'd collected and found these words from Trustee Sundheim. We have done a fair amount in this district, and the honest to God truth is, we haven't done nearly enough. Time has passed, and Sun Trustee Sundheim may no longer feel that way, considering the current budget but I think it remains true. 
Relative to the county, the district has done an impressive amount to address racism in our schools. Relative to the problem, we have not done enough. We need Ms. Mateo Toledo's help so much. We need her full attention on issues of diversity and inclusion. This is a job for a team of people, but if it has to be just one person, we are blessed to have it be her. She is a veteran of the district, deeply committed to our schools and inclusion work. She is a founding member of the Race Matters Committee, the founder of the Multicultural Book Fair, and is pursuing her PhD with a focus on students of color in majority white school districts. I read an article from Harvard Business that stated in the year 2020, everyone is looking for the unicorn candidate to fill the role of coordinator of diversity, followed by the suggestion that organizations should lower their expectations. They will not find this unicorn. We have the unicorn. Thank you to the board for the opportunity to make a public comment. Thank you. Pat McGrath. Hello, my name is Kat McGrath. I'm a resident of Hastings and a parent of a ninth grade student who attends Hastings High School. Prior to 2018, I was also a national education reporter for PBS NewsHour for over a decade and have witnessed some of the best and worst in public education. I should say, I think I have a pretty good sense of when something does promise and when it doesn't. Um, this is my first time speaking at a meeting this year. So I'd first like to share my immense gratitude to everyone on the board for their service to our district. Our school is in excellent hands with this board and I thank each and every one of you. Tonight I'm here to show my support for one of the many excellent decisions the board has made to advance the role of the diversity coordinator. I believe this position should be a full-time position for many reasons that our speakers tonight have so far and will continue to articulate better than I can. Um, when I first heard about this effort, curious who else felt the same way, I reached out to friends via email and posted a petition on Facebook. 71, oh, it looks like 74 people now have signed this have signed this petition that says, in signing this document, I am showing my support for the diversity coordinator position becoming full-time. I will email this document to the board. In the document, I also included some quotes that I read in discussions on 10706 parents that stood out to me and in other groups like uh, Hastings Rise. People wrote, the diversity coordinator has been vital to anti-racist and inclusivity, inclusivity efforts across the three schools. The work Janice does in her position is aligned with our values as a community and our purpose as a district. We have a national crisis. Hatred, violence, harassment, and murder stemming from racism have exploded. Our neighbors and friends here and across the country are hurting, they are scared, and we need more white people to stand up and speak up against racism. I'm 100% certain that each and every board member supports the idea of this DEI position. And lastly, we are a community and a nation. We as a community and nation should go in a direction that reflects what America stands for. So these are just some of the comments that, you know, maybe folks um, who are not able to be here tonight expressed. Uh, they, they really rang out to me and I wanted to share them with you and also, you know, bring some of the people who, you know, can't be here tonight, bring their names re as reflected in this petition. Um, lastly, uh, you know, I mean, a part-time diversity coordinator is a really excellent first step. It has great potential. Let's see it through. Thank you. Thank you. Nanisha Nunez. 
Thank you. Um, hi, all. Um, thank you for your time today. I decided to come and speak to you all again um, about the importance of the diversity coordinator position and to show my support for making that position full time. Um, unfortunately, all too often as a community, the only time we know about, you know, incidents of Ms. Mateo Toledo's work is when there's a response to some sort of incident of bias or racism. And she has done such an incredible job in helping our administrators do exactly that, um, especially because some of our most well-meaning administrators don't always have the skill set or training to properly recognize assess and address these incidents. But her role has been so much more critical than just that. You know, as parents and caretakers of children of color, every day we send our children to an institution that is part of a system that quite frankly was built to uphold white supremacy and all too often murders the spirits of our precious children. And this is not a feeling that I have, but a proven fact. And, um, you know, Benita loves book, We Want to Do More Than Survive talks about this way more eloquently than I ever can. But having a person sit in the role of diversity coordinator, a person who has that racial literacy background to not only confront inc incidents of bias, but to educate well-meaning staff on harmful implications of lessons, to be a safe haven for families who are whose voices are often marginalized, to partner with teams to create culturally responsive lessons where all learners thrive and therefore prepare our children to become contributing members of a global society, all that is so invaluable. And as a person who has served on the, the board of that, I know this is such a difficult job. And I was here at the inception of this position. And frankly, I've been often floored by the amount that Ms. Mateo Toledo has been able to accomplish with such a short release time. Um, I can go on and on about her work um, as some of my other community members have, but I would definitely run out of time. I will conclude by just saying, that we know that school budgets reflect what we as a community value. And in this moment in time, April of 2021, as we continue to watch this cycle of hate, the cycle of police brutality, which is met with outrage in communities and then promises of reform, but no real change, I implore the board to show that you are all committed to creating a safe learning space where all members of the learning community are seen uplifted, heard, and understood. And you do that by committing to a full-time diversity, diversity coordinator position so that families can breathe as we cling to the hope that change is possible within the only thing that we can control. And that's our school community. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it seems like the person that had their hand up put their hand down. Um, I have one um, last comment that was sent in, so I'm going to read it from um, Lauren Jen. Dear board and Hastings community, I'm writing tonight to publicly register support for increasing the diversity coordinator position to a full time position. I have followed the budget proceedings closely and was very excited to see Hastings taking forward steps in expanding this position. Especially in light of the full funding from the state, I thought this was a great step in a forward thinking budget. However, I was quite surprised that this expansion was cut from the budget at the latest, at the latest work session. A budget reflects the values of a community. As a community, we have publicly stated that we desire an anti-racist education for our children. Yet time and time again, our actions send a different message. Why, why is it that anti-racism education is seen as expendable in the budget? What message does that send about our priorities? This is a critical time in our nation's history. We are reconciling with our past as a movement for social justice has demanded that we do better for our children. Here in Hastings, we are not immune to racism and discrimination. Earlier this year, I heard the Board of Board of Ed state that anti-racism education was important. However, I'm disappointed that it appears that actions are being taken, have been taken that ignore and marginalize students, staff, and faculty of color. Between a refusal to expand the DC position and an expansion of police presence in our schools, 
We are sending a clear message through our actions. Is this the message we want to send, especially in a year where there is full funding from the state? Please consider how our budget reflects our priorities. Ongoing austerity austerity messaging in this district perpetuates a dangerous mentality. We are an affluent district. We can prioritize anti-racism, academic excellence, and inclusion and support for all students. Thank you, Lauren Jen, Hillside Parents. Oh, and I see we have two other commenters. Um, Michelle Vevoda. Hi, thanks. Okay, hi, my name is Michelle Vivoda. I'm a resident of Hastings and I'm here tonight to advocate for the diversity coordinator position to be increased to full time. I'm aware of the budgetary realities in the district and I'm speaking tonight from a place of empathy. I've sat in budget meetings and I do know how tight things are. At the same time, I'm speaking tonight from a place of great concern for our community and for our country. I was at the Black Lives Matter demonstration planned by the high school students in Draper Park last spring. I heard board members and district leadership speak about our unwavering commitment to supporting students of color and to do better on issues of anti-racism. I don't doubt a word that was spoken that day, just like I don't doubt for a second the desire of every board member to expand our district's commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. The intention is there, I know that. However, the action, equitable allocation of funding to support diversity, equity, and inclusion work in the district continues to be missing. I know that this year, that in this year of austerity, a budget item that was of immense importance to the community was, rest was restoring a high school physics teacher position that had been cut. I'm not here to dispute that allocation. Science has taken quite a beating over the past year, and we certainly need more robust science offerings in our curriculum. However, it strikes me that while not every child in the district takes physics, every single child in the district is impacted by diversity, equity, and inclusion work and the work of the diversity coordinator, whether it be through the diver diverse books fair, the Courageous Conversations curriculum and other work. This is indeed a district-wide position, yet it is a part-time position. When this community desired district-wide curricular coordination, we hired an assistant superintendent of curriculum. I believe that a similar step needs to be taken for DEI work. Interestingly, while the diversity coordinator's position stayed at point six this year, the work expanded with Courageous Conversations now beginning in fourth grade. Is this what we mean by doing better, requiring more work for the same amount of pay? As a white woman who works on an anti-racism committee in my higher ed institution, I've seen how this work tends to play out and be compensated. It is largely grassroots, unpaid, driven by passion, and is typically done by women and women of color, the very humans who are already shouldering the vast majority of the emotional work amidst our multiple pandemics. When students of color experience racism or feel unseen, they typically turn to the few teachers of color in the school district, which increases the workload of our teachers of color. A full-time diversity coordinator and educator also makes sense for the district. With the full-time diversity coordinator educator, our district's teachers could have a resource to help them teach texts that deal with topics and aspects of who we are and have been as a nation that make readers uncomfortable and to do so in culturally responsive ways. After the debate that consumes so much of this community this winter related to the Sherman Alexi book, doesn't it seem like we should be increasing our resources for creative conversations and culturally responsive teaching? Once again, I know that the budget is tight and the needs are enormous. I also know that New York State just passed a budget that will hopefully bring more funding to our district. The bottom line is this, do we maintain the status quo and keep saying what, that we want to do better but just can't afford to this year? Or do we take a step forward towards becoming a more anti-racist school district and put our money where our mouth is? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Laura Weitzman. Hi, my name is Laura Weitzman and I'm a resident of Hastings with a child in the middle school and formerly a child in the high school. And um, I've been so impressed listening to my neighbors and how much homework they've done and how knowledgeable they are. And I am really just speaking to you um, from the heart right now um, as I listen to what's going on as um, a consultant specializing in organizational equity and inclusion and racial justice for the past 25 years. I can tell you that without a doubt, every organization that I've worked with that has a diversity initiative ultimately does not make deep change. The ones that make deep change are the ones that 
understand that an equity lens is something that has to be applied to everything that's not done, not only to special programs. And so when I th think about what I've at least heard, and I admit that I am not well educated on what's happening with the budget, but what I've heard is about um, equal cuts across the board or not, not expanding, even if there aren't cuts. I wanna say that an equality perspective is not a systems view of creating change and justice in our community, right? We have a community that's incredibly um, wealthy and that is very uh, heavily primarily white. And I would say that um, that is likely the inheritance of redlining practices and other kinds of white flight um, uh, history from the past. And that's not going to get solved through, um, you know, part-time efforts and through uh, a sort of like a, a partial approach here and there. I think the work that has been done so far is an incredible foundation. I've been so impressed. And I just want to really, really encourage you to not think about equal application, but equitable application to make sure that the, um, programs and approaches that need the most are getting the most so that our community can live up to the values that I think so many of us hold here and the reason so many of us move to Hastings on Hudson. Thank you. Thank you. Kalani Marshall. You can unmute yourself. You can um, read the letter that you have for the board. Melissa, he's indicated his microphone hasn't been working well. And would it be possible? Um, yeah, let me send an email he referenced. Hi, board members. My name is Kalani Marshall. I am a current senior and I have known Ms. Mateo Toledo for two years now. Since that point, I've seen the tremendous work she has done for the betterment of the district and community. As the president of the Affinity Group for Students of Color, I have also seen the incredible influence she has had on the group in supporting and uplifting members and to become hardworking individuals more confident speakers and inspirational students. I wouldn't be where I am now if it weren't for her. And I know that she will make future students the future leaders that we have seen in the past year. She educates us and helps us lead the difficult conversations that we need to be having in Hastings. I hope that after I leave Hastings, she will be able to continue growing in this position that has proven to be so necessary and important for all the students in Hastings. Thank you for reading this, Kalani Marshall. Um, I think that's all we have for public comment. Okay, thank you. We appreciate hearing all this feedback from the community. Um, we've now arrived at the business portion of our meeting. And our first item of business is the adoption of the 2021-2022 school budget. So I'd like to open it up by asking whether or not we have any questions or comments that board trustees would like and make would like to make in reference to the proposed budget and open it up. I'll start. Um, I did want to speak um, in reference to um, the diversity quarter, uh, coordinator position and the many emails that the board received um, and let people know that you know every member of the board reads and considers your input and they know that this is, I mean, I believe every member of our board is very committed to these um, ideas of social justice, um, of anti-racist, um, 
curriculum um, of inclusion and we we hear you um, and we're we are proud of the work that is being done um, from you know um, Dr. Henning Piedmont and Lynn Walker working regularly on um, trying to attract more diverse candidates to our district um, and having Dr. Um, Price Dennis um, in terms of professional development, working with teachers and expanding her role. Um, Ms. Mansky and Ms. Mateo Toledo have worked regularly with her and are looking to expand her role. Really what this is about is um, the budget right now. We currently um, spend more than we make every year. And that's a problem in terms of dipping into our reserves. And I think the board is coming from a fiduciary, are looking very seriously at our fiduciary responsibility and saying, you know, we're thrilled that we got state aid and um, hopefully federal aid, which is earmarked for certain things, but coming to us. It's not so much about this next year, it's about the year after and the year after that. Um, we don't want to have to reduce again and take on year to year expansions um, that we can't, we literally cannot afford. Um, the restoration of the science position doesn't just affect uh, the physics class, but also middle school science and um, elective offerings and, uh, you know, numerous things along those lines. Um, and that was a restoration, but nothing else has been added. Um, last year, again, during sort of austere times, the diversity coordinator position was raised from 0.2 to 0.6. Um, and, you know, I think most people feel that this is, a, this is important. Let's have the groups that we, all the affinity groups that were developed, the, um, um, the numerous parent groups, teacher groups, um, the culturally, the diverse books committee, the, um, you know, who's developing culturally responsive um, checklists um, and the time to talk about social justice and racism <laughs> um, meetings that are happening and student affinity groups, racial equity days. Let's have everybody come together and figure out what is the best, most effective data-driven next step and harness all that energy and all that good work and figure out what's our next way forward, our next step forward, um, just at the time when we can hopefully figure out what the budget will remain, you know, the kind of monies that will come in, not just for this year, but for next. Otherwise we, you know, we are in that same position of just draining reserves and spending more than we have, which is <laughs> dwindling our budget um, to a point that it's, it just doesn't feel like we're being financially responsible if we add anything. Um, so that's where we're coming from. Um, not, we would love to say yes to, to this and to many more things um, in this moment. Um, we just don't, we feel that we, we can responsibly do that in, in, this, in this moment. It uh, doesn't mean we won't get there and we won't be looking to get there. So, um, God, I'm shaking as I try to think about how to talk about this. Um, I just want to preface what I want to say with, um, I appreciate the people who came and spoke tonight. Um, most are people who I don't know, have not even ever heard of. And I think that people were so, I hate to use the word articulate, it's such a, has not a great word these days, but people, the different ideas that were expressed, um, I don't think I could say what I want to say now um, in nearly um, the same poignant way and, and, and strike the same chords. But, um, and my, my thoughts and comments have nothing to do with what other people have said, or I haven't had contact with people who spoke tonight. This is purely coming from me, my experience in the district and my 
personal and work-related experience. But, you know, we've started to do diversity work a long time ago in our district, relatively speaking to other districts. And we've engaged in a lot of diversity work in a lot of areas. And to the point that other districts come to us now when the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion work is sort of what's up. And it's so important everywhere, in every way. Um, it's sort of popped, I guess, in a way, um, this year as we've kind of lived through the, the racial pandemic along with the COVID pandemic. Um, and in our districts, it has permeated faculty, staff, students, curriculum, personal, professional development. Um, but I hear what you're saying, Allison, and I, and I understand, and I am always about our fiduciary responsibility and thinking about taxpayers and how we manage our budget. But I feel like um, that it is most important at this time um, that we give serious consideration to this position as being a full-time position. I think if we think about what's going on in the world, um, I think for those of you who attended the anti-Asian Pacific Islander violence vigil on Sunday at Draper Park, which was, and um, a shout out to Sylvia's son who read a beautiful poem at the end. Um, it was incredibly moving and it opens us to a whole other world of racism that we often don't think about in terms of how um, Asians, Pacific Islanders are so often not seen and heard and silenced. Um, and if you think about how that affects all, certainly all the kids in our district. Um, and we think about what's going on in our district this year, even. Um, and I speak about this, you know, in my work at the medical school, since we've hired a Dean for diversity, um, and the work that's being done there on diversity, equity, inclusion, and I see how it permeates every part of the school. And I think that's exactly what this position does and would do. And there's, there's more work than there's time to be, <laughs> to do it. Um, I just, just in my mind, um, there's no question in my mind that we need to devote money in our budget to fund this as a 1.0 position. Um, and I guess what I feel is like, in some ways, I don't feel like, I don't really feel like there is a choice. And I feel like it's it, now, I don't know. I, I, I just have to tell you to be watching the verdict from the Derek Chauvin trial today and think that we're not gonna fund a full-time diversity coordinator in Hastings I, I can't, um, even if it means going $50,000 into our reserves, that's something that I, I, and I think that's why I'm shaking. I, I cannot abide by that. That is just goes against every grain in what I think we need to keep doing. We've been doing it, but we need to keep doing it and doing it more and more. And it's only gonna be more and more to be done. You know, this is not gonna like, we do a little work and everything's gonna calm down. This is the work that we all have to be doing for the rest of our lives. And we have to help our children um, know how to think about it, experience, be in the world, be with other children, be with other adults. And that's what we're, we have to educate them to do. And I think we need a person in this position who has the responsibility to kind of work with people and guide us in this direction. Thank you. Thanks, Jody. Jody I, I just I just wanted to, oh. who was talking? I, I just yeah, go to ahead. I just wanted to just reference the uh, American yeah. Rescue Plan Act for the board. So that does provide some funding that can be earmarked, uh, you know, over the course of the next two years for the position so that the board does not have to go into their reserves. So just keep that in mind. The American Rescue Plan Act, um, Maureen has referenced that. So that is available that, um, and can be earmarked uh, to support the expansion of the position. Thanks, thanks. Uh, I'm actually, hopefully I can, you can still see me. I'm, I'm on my phone. I'm gonna go into some notes that I have, but uh, Jody, I appreciate what, what you said. And, and uh, you know, I'm of the same, similar mindset. Um, 
and not so much because you know we we hear from you know a ton of people in town and you know it changes anything uh, but i i, I want to kind of talk about how how i view the position and, and my thoughts uh, first and this isn't these comments aren't about any particular uh person uh person's uh comments today i, I wrote these down earlier uh, but I do think it's it's dangerous to weaponize race. This notion that it's an all or nothing choice is is not really fair. I mean, everyone on the board um, you know, believes in in racial equality and in in the diversity position. Um, so I, I I just want to say I disagree that keeping it at point six would mean that we don't care about the position. I I think we should start there. And really, I really really appreciate the people who made comments and wrote letters with that understanding that there are trade-offs because that is the case. Um, and I think that's the case with, with most decisions that the board makes. And, uh, you know, I've been on the board for three years and we always get into these positions in Hastings where it's sort of a, if you don't support this, then, then it means this, or it means that. Um, so, I, you know, I think the community should just, you know, keep that in mind when, when issues come up in the future. With that said, I view the cost of this position as very small for a huge impact. And, and based on Valerie's comments just now, it's, it's even smaller cost because, uh, you know, $50,000 and a $52 million budget is, is pretty tiny and, and not that every dollar doesn't matter. And I'm sure people are going to say, I can't believe he said that, you know, $50,000 doesn't matter, but, but there's a big impact this position has. It literally has a positive impact on every student in the district. I think someone referenced this and I completely agree. Not everyone plays an instrument, not everyone plays a sport, uh, but everyone and parents included need to be mindful of diversity issues and the work will truly never be done where it's constant. And uh, you know, when I grew up in White Plains, we had a full-time human relations person in the school and I'm sure many people thought, felt that it was not the wisest choice of funding, but the person in the position made a big difference in the school for the actual students. And uh, I think Janice has proven that uh, her work is making a difference. And yeah, I know from you know trying to balance multiple roles in, in my own jobs that you know it's hard to to have literally two different positions. And I think that. Caitlin Chang said it well. You know, like Janice, we have we have a unicorn. She's she's really good at what she does. Uh, so I think that it is a very small cost for a uh, large impact. Now, as part of the role, I do hope, and I'd love for Valerie to talk about this a little bit more. Uh, I do hope that we can commit to launching uh, the Our Neighbors program with Yonkers or or other types of programs. I really think it's important that we stop thinking about just our own little town and expose our kids to the real world right around us. Valerie and I have talked about this for the last year. There's a lot of diversity in Yonkers and Greenberg and, and Valerie started conversations last year with the, or earlier this school year with the Yonkers superintendent about an exciting program to further exposure for, uh, for students in Hastings with kids in other districts. And Valerie, I'd, I'd love, for you to kind of just walk through that program. I know you have some high school teachers that are taking the lead. I'd love for Janice to, to commit to uh, getting that program over the finish line. And whether this position moves to full-time or, or 0.6, it's a great program. They've done it in Long Island. Uh, it would make a huge impact. And it's so important that kids get exposure. It's not just all of us in town talking about how important these issues are. It's, it's true exposure. So Valerie, I'd love for you to kind of just walk the community through what we're thinking. Sure, and, and thank you so much, Jeremy. And, and uh, you've been um, nurturing this idea for a while. And um, when you first mentioned it to me, it was sort of at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, so, you know, it really wasn't something that we could, you know, move forward on uh, at that time, but certainly, um, you know, another opportunity became available when a uh, program on Long Island um, you know, that was advertised um, on the Onboard magazine uh, sponsored by the New York State School Boards Association, uh, publicized the program between a middle school in a predominantly 
um, African American and Caribbean community in Long Island, and that that partnered with a, a school district in another part of Long Island, which was predominantly, you know, white. And so uh, Jeremy then sent that article to me, and um, I then uh, forwarded it to my colleague um, in uh, Yonkers, um, Edwin, and and um, he was um, absolutely excited about considering. Um, a, an initiative between Hastings and uh, and Yonkers, since we sit on each other's border um, and we're neighbors, and uh, that became sort of the genesis of an idea, Jeremy, that you've been nurturing, um, and and now it it can move forward. Uh, we have a contact in Yonkers. It's an opportunity this year to do planning with some students. So the plan now with. Um, the, the interest and the uh, um, uh, efforts of uh, Sarah Walters, of, uh, of uh, Faye uh, Barenfeld, of Tessa Stewart, and of Ross Abrams. They'll all be involved in you know, working with uh, students here as well as in Yonkers with the um, particular person who's involved in Yonkers to um, pull students together to get some ideas from them around what would inspire them to be involved. So having you know, student involvement in, in planning, we all agreed was very important before launching the program. So um, there'll be this planning phase between now and the end of the school year, and then they'll open the new school year um, you know, with a, a program that will involve you know, a variety of, 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 of ideas that, you know, that manifest in terms of uh, visits, to um, um, tr you know, uh, tr you know, field trips together, to projects, and you know, all kinds of things to sort of get to know each other. So that's really, you know, sort of the, the um, you know, I guess at the core of it is that you know, these two school districts, very different, sitting on the same geographic border, who don't have contact with each other, and that uh, again is. Um, in service to to idea that you kept holding on to Jeremy so that will move forward and and again thinking about the American Rescue Plan Act you know it also provides you know opportunity to uh, uh, finance some stipends you know for you know the the uh, you know the teachers who are going to be involved who already have a successful history both Ross and Sarah in running the um, uh, I forget the name of the program that they ran is Borders program I guess with a, a district in uh, a school in Harlem and one of the was a charter borders. School. It was crossing borders. Yes, crossing. So they've had a very successful history with that. Great. So they can, you know, they're the right people and they, you know, to be involved in, in growing uh, a program um, uh, with the ideas of students from both Yonkers and Hastings in developing this initiative. Uh, so there'll be an opportunity from uh, and through the use of the American Rescue Plan funds for those stipends, plus, you know, some other kinds of, you know, program offerings, you know, that may include, you know, uh, trips to uh, Broadway play or other kinds of things that they can do because it's all about being together. And, you know, and once, you know, students see that they're more than their ethnicity or linguistic difference or race, you know, gender, gender identity, all of those things that they truly do begin to appreciate each other and develop friendships and in some sense of, you know, humanity together. So I think that's going to be a really exciting, one of the exciting things that can grow from this um, and, and can be the seeds, you know, for other initiatives. So uh, thank you again, Jeremy, for keeping the, the dream alive. Yeah, thanks for pushing it. And, and, uh, you know, I, I, I hope, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm uh, a believer that, that we should, uh, you know, add this to the budget in terms of moving the position to a, a full time. Uh, so, you know, count, count me in with Jody on, uh, on my position on, on the diversity position. So I'd like to chime in um, and just say that I really appreciate all the people who came forward and and honestly a lot of the comments that I that I heard from the public are perspectives that I share and before I had the opportunity to serve as a trustee and was elected to this position almost 2 years ago you know I was an active parent in both the PTSA's inclusion working group and as a part of the leadership in the Rise community group um, because if you can't tell by looking at me I'm not white and I'm pretty cognizant of not being white in this very white community. Throughout my life, as the daughter of Mexican immigrants, married to a South Asian man, 
parent to three brown boys who've been in our schools for the past 11 years, the issue of diversity, it isn't something that is important to me because it's timely or because it's in current events. It's because it's the life that I've experienced. And I get very um, emotional and passionate uh, hearing, you know, what people bring to the table in terms of their perspectives, because it's really important to me that people feel heard and they feel valued. I know that that was one of the reasons that I felt that it was really important to advocate for diversity issues, because at least when I became more um, at the forefront of lobbying for those efforts uh, about five years back, I really felt like our district wasn't doing very much. And I will say that I was heartened to see that the district did step forward at that time. And it came in incremental steps and came in first having courageous conversations having the diverse books initiative, you know, a number of the different things that some of my fellow board members have already um, made note of. And that gave me some measure of relief to say, you know, I live in a community where this is valued, where as a community, we confront issues of inequity, racism, and we tackle them head on. I have been fortunate to see, you know, just how much Ms. Mateo Toledo has accomplished, you know, first in the 0.2 position and then having been bumped up to the 0.6 position last year. And I will say it is very hard as a board member to sit through the elimination of so many positions, so many cuts, and to simultaneously say, you know what? this position of such, is of such importance that we're gonna bump it up in this hyper austerity environment. But we did it. We did it because we wanted to demonstrate a commitment and say, we're not about lip service. You know, we take action and we support people who, who make demonstrable changes in our school district. But I have to say that as regards to this budget, I don't wanna be judged by a vote that I cast on a position. My humanity, my allegiance, and my focus on diversity issues cannot be reduced and judged by whether or not I decide to expand a position. I am a fiduciary of this district. And I am also conscious of the fact that as the only person of color on this board, whether or not we wanna recognize that my actions and my vote are evaluated through a different prism. Because I will tell you that I hear it not only from, I think very well-intentioned Caucasian folks and also from you know, my people of color from my background and from other backgrounds that they feel let down because I think that there's a certain amount of racism also in saying, I'm gonna vote for this person because I know they're gonna be a sure bet. That is offensive, that is insulting, and I am more than that. I can see that, and I ran on the fact that I would be faithful and have integrity and put my own personal convictions aside when I made impartial decisions. And in this situation, I believe it's important to be cognizant of what the financial constraints are on us over the long term. I don't feel comfortable adding on to the expenses that we have, not knowing what's coming in the future. And maybe people will think that that's a cop out, but it's not. To me, I have to be able to look at the information that's presented to me. And even if it's unpopular, even if people think less of me, say, you know what? I made the best decision with the best of intentions. And in the final analysis, I can't do this now. If we see changed circumstances in a year from now, I'm certainly open to expanding the position. I've done it along the way as a parent. 
I've done it as a member of this Board of Education in the only other budget cycle that I've been through, but I don't think that I, I mean, I don't, not that I don't think, I don't support expanding the position for the diversity coordinator for the upcoming budget cycle. And that is not a reflection of my values. It's a reflection of what we owe to the district overall. First and foremost, we took an oath to be fiduciaries. And I take that really seriously. You got to be a fool to try to follow after Sylvia, and I am that fool. But uh, I don't have as much weight when I speak. But I do uh, want to talk about the budget in general. And the budget was a lot of people's work for a lot of months. And uh, if I say we a couple times, I, I meant to say I, you know, we are a, we are a group of seven, but uh, I spoke out quite often that I wanted to see a smaller budget. I spoke up quite often on areas that I thought we could uh, look into, but right now uh, I'm comfortable with this budget. This budget has a lot of expenses and a lot of priorities, and I don't want to try to play one against another. At this point, I don't think we're in a position to evaluate a recently increased, extremely important role. So there's been a lot of key leaves this year. This has been a very atypical year. And if it takes one year or two years to evaluate a position, it's because it's more than one person. Our DEI focus involves adding administrators, adding job descriptions that we want our principals to work through. But the truth is most of what we need in our schools comes from our teachers. And we are working with a program to strengthen what our English department, our social studies department primarily can deliver. As a math teacher, it's definitely just on the edges when I try to bring in diversity and inclusion into a classroom. So I'm comfortable with some aspects of this budget and some aspects still concern me, but this isn't the year to, to open up everything. This isn't the week, this isn't the month to look at it. I, uh, I appreciate the, it's probably pretty close to 50 emails from a lot of concerns. Things that I'm focusing on in this budget that I'm willing to support as it is, we're prioritizing special education right now. It's been, uh, I don't know, two years, 10 years, but there's been a change in our community, what we need to deliver to students. And we've added administrators, we've added increases costs. We're prioritizing a new bond, partly because we didn't have enough space in Hillside to provide uh, what we need. And of course we are maintaining small classes. We are creating a curriculum superintendent. So this is not the year to do a one year evaluation of a recent position. And I'm not concerned if we do not do it this year or next year. Let's see what our needs are and what our progresses are. Every year we have this position, our building leaders and our teachers are getting more and more strong with their ability to adapt and change where we're at. So I'm gonna be able to support this budget and I'm going to be able to uh, work moving forward. And if things are beautiful and the federal government and the state decide to keep prioritizing districts like ours, then we will be able to keep expanding on our priorities for our students and what our teachers needs. But not every problem needs to be solved by adding another administrator. And in this week, we've heard a lot of voices 
but every amount is small. We could make any position 1.4, 1.6. So I don't want to focus on it as a financial number here. For me, this isn't a, a financial. Some of the other issues in the budget were. In general, I'm concerned about the financial picture, and I've spoke out about that. This is an important position that we evaluate, and we don't evaluate it by a one-week letter writing campaign. We don't evaluate it by a, a one-week board meeting. Key important teachers have had to have absences this year. Let's see how we're growing next year. Let's see what our budget situation is next year. We are a leader. I shouldn't say we, I wasn't on this board. I was an administrator. Our district is a leader in creating this position. I'm happy to be part of this board at a, a full-time employee who puts some of her efforts towards administration and some of her efforts towards teaching. I think it's, uh, as Sylvia said, it was a bold move to increase the position, and I'd like to hold it right here and evaluate our progress every year. We're getting stronger. Are there any further comments or questions from members of the Board of Education? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My mute button wasn't working. <clears throat> what I just said was brilliant, by the way, but you didn't get to hear it. Um, so um, I first of all appreciate everything the board members have said, and I appreciate the complexity of you know, not just the fifty thousand uh, dollar budget line item. I mean, I think it's 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 there's the complexity of first of all the budget. You know, uh, what I think some people in town might not know is that um, we have had um, we have had what's called a growth factor for years, which is uh, a growth in the assessed value of our of, of the property in our town, which has made it so that we can create budgets that don't pierce the tax cap. And that growth factor is gone now. Uh, and for the foreseeable future, it's gone. So I think that that's been this backdrop. It's not really talking specifically about this position, but it's been a backdrop against which we've been having a variety of conversations and it's been a backdrop against which we've looked at reserves decreasing pretty quickly. Now we did get a bump up this year. We got a bump up because we got some federal money. We got a we got reinstatement of foundation aid. Um, and we don't know how long that's going to be. So it's very hard to make ongoing operational decisions based on money that was granted to us. And so I think that's been a background. Um, so that's just kind of some of the background uh, of, uh, as everyone in this town knows very well, when we want to add anything, we have to go to the taxpayers and that's individual homeowners to do it. And they feel the pinch much more in our town than in a town, even like Irvington that has a much larger commercial tax base. Um, you know, or a town like Irvington's got the uh, same amount of kids and about $12 million more in their budget. So. Um, you know, and Maureen's not here, but kudos to Maureen for many years for managing a very complex uh, set of considerations and, um, and you know, keep us, keeping us in a place for how long has the tax cap been around? Six years or seven years? We've not had to pierce the tax cap. Um, part of that is because of, because of the growth factor. Part of that is because of Maureen's management, quite frankly. Um, so I think that's the back backdrop. You know, some of the, I hate to use the word um, easier money, but it's kind of what it's been over the past four or five years is, is kind of gone now. And I think that's the backdrop of which, now having said that, um, you know, as someone mentioned, $50,000, you know, you can find $50,000, you can. Um, so I just wanna share some thoughts 
that I have about this position. You know, I think uh, as anyone who was here last year remembers, um, there was actually a debate last year about moving it from 0.2 to 0.4, which was a pretty heated debate. Um, and uh, we were committed and we, we talked about the commitment back then. And we talked about um, what you can do with 0.6 versus 0.2 and what that allows for. Um, and it's a lot of the things that um, we've uh, just in the simplest form, mindshare. When you have 0.6 versus 0.2 mindshare, you can think about things a lot more and that has a lot of value to it. Um, you can think about stuff more with one, with one, you know, uh, as, a point to, as opposed to 0.6. But I, I think it, it is important to note that we are constantly trying to balance the investment. And it was a big conversation last year to go to 0.4, and several board members were very against going even to 0.4. We went to point, we went to 0.6, excuse me. Um, and I think one of the things uh, I think we, we struggled with this year is to really have the conversation about what does the future look like? Remember last year, uh, Ms. Mateo Toledo gave a really excellent about 20 slide presentation about focus and where we were and what we were doing. And that provided a backdrop. I think just because it's been, Ms. Mateo Toledo had to take some leave. Um, I think uh, it's, there's been a lot of stuff going on. Um, board members maybe didn't ask for it, but I don't think we've had some of the robust conversations of what does the investment look like? Because I think we have to remember the investments more than just moving from a 0.6 to a 1.0. The investment is training, the investment is strategy, the investment is, you know, there was a great article by David Brooks. What did we learn over the last year in the New York Times about two, three months ago? And it was trainings aren't really that powerful. It's the stuff that Dr. Henning Piedmont and, and Jeremy Arnon were just talking about that's really powerful. It's creating those, I think as Dr. Henning Piedmont just said, those opportunities for being together. And um, some of that doesn't take time. It takes time to plan it. But I think just because it's been such a crazy year, we don't really have the clear game plan of how we're going to spend that time and energy. Um, I'm committed to this position. I think anyone who's seen me over the past couple of years uh, has known that. I'm committed to the investment of this position. Um, I, uh, I think, you know, for example, um, the program that um, Dr. Henning Piedmont and Jeremy Aaron and I were just talking about, I wasn't actually aware of. I'll admit, it's been a rough year for me. <laughs> Maybe we had a conversation about it at a board meeting and I missed it because I was checked out somehow. It's been a rough year on a lot of fronts. So I apologize if that was the case. And if that wasn't the case and we just didn't talk about it, we didn't talk about it. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, I've had conversations with a variety of other administrators um, around the area, different districts, some where the head of diversity is being rolled into some other position and some where there is no head of diversity. Um, and in many ways, we're still ahead of most districts in the work that we're doing um, from race matters to the courageous conversation to the diversity coordinator. So I, I, if I were to bet I think we're going to be at a place where we're going to have a 1.0 at some point, pretty soon, perhaps next year. Um, I think uh, I would really like to understand better how that investment is going to look, not just as the role, but as the whole programmatic investment. Um, I don't think we've seen that as a board. I don't think we've had those conversations as a board. What does that full investment look like? Um, we haven't spoken about that. I'm comfortable right now with uh, Ms. Mateo Toledo, Ms. Szymanski, other people in the district, really fleshing out some of that thinking, really clarifying what that's gonna look like. I'm still comfortable with 0.6 as being an opportunity to really drive forward some of the stuff that we're doing. Hopefully some of the stuff that Dr. Henning Piemont and Jeremy just outlined. I think there's a great line in that article by David Brooks, which was, I think the thing we've learned this year is that trainings struggle to have an impact. And that real power is when people change, when they're put in new environments and permanent relation with diverse groups of people. And I, I think we need to really think about how we create those opportunities. 
I personally don't know uh, what the game plan around that is. How do we do that as a district? How do we create um, a situation in which uh, we really have people in relationship with a diverse group of people on an ongoing basis? More of that. How do we do that? Um, that's the kind of stuff I'd like to talk about. I don't necessarily see that moving to a 1.0 right now is going to do that automatically. I think that takes time. I think we can start that as a 0.6. I think we can evolve those programs. I think we can create some of those opportunities. Um, look, if you ask me right now, I'm comfortable with the budget we set as, as a 0.6. Uh, I'm committed to growing our commitment. Um, I'm also very aware of the fact that we've heard from a lot of people around town, many of whom are not going to be on this call and they're not going to talk, uh, about feeling financially pinched this year. A lot of people uh, feel financially um, distressed. They're not coming on this call and they're not sharing their comments at a public, uh, at a public meeting. So uh, I'm just aware of the broad cross section of people, many of whom shared very eloquently and articulately on this call their commitment, uh, much of which I share, and many people who weren't on this call who are also sharing their concerns and commitments uh, uh, about our district. So uh, to me, it's about balance. Currently, this is a good balance, and, and I see further commitment uh, as we move forward. I, I just want to say something in response to that, Doug, and I, I very much appreciate hearing from everybody, and obviously, this is not an easy decision, but um, you know, you're know, you forgetting that Valerie also just told us that we could have this money for two years, that it's not gonna come from our reserves, number one, which would give us the time to kind of develop and look at and see. And, you know, and I think you're suggesting that all these other things that could be done, um, you know, Janice herself may have a game plan that we haven't heard about. I regret that we didn't hear all of this earlier in the budget process, but my, my guess is that she probably has a game plan of what it would look like if she had a 1.0 position. But you also have to remember that, I guess for me, I think this is a full-time job. And I think when you're doing it as a 0.6, she also has 0.4 other responsibilities. And I think all of us know, we've all worked, we all know what it means when you have a part-time job that is not a part-time job or rarely. And so I, I do think it also puts, it, 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 I just, I guess I just think that it's a full-time job and um, don't know what the cost would be to us. I wonder if, um, uh, I, 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 this is, I'll just be honest, this is the first time I'm hearing about that money, this meeting. So I, can you, Valerie, just tell, tell us a little bit more about that? And again, it may be my fault. I, I apologize. Maureen mentioned it, but it wasn't with relationship to this. It was at, to do with other stuff in our budget. It just came through. It just came through like last week or something, right? Couple, at least two weeks. Um, so through the um, American uh, Rescue Plan Act, um, districts received uh, some additional funds uh, on top of some restoration of fun, you know, foundation aid. Uh, which, um, you know, districts have really been, uh, you know, pining for for a very long time. Uh, but the beauty of these funds is that, you know, while they're, you know, you, 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 we certainly can't commit beyond two years, I think that using the funds, you know, that you didn't have to, you know, for this very important, you know, um, uh, need is, you know, is, you know, you, you know, it's a gift, you know, you're not going to get that gift and they're not, a, and, and we have to be very, and there's, there's certain parameters uh, by which districts have to describe how they're using those funds and they really are using funds that, you know, do support, you know, other areas that, you know, districts would like to have, you know, increased in certain areas. So it's both student related. So there's programming for students, but there's also supports or um, the ability for districts to use the monies similar to how we use any of the federal grants. So, you know, you know, from, you know, uh, uh, the 611 and 616, 619 grants, which are for special education, and then the, the um, Every Student Succeeds grant, Title I, Title II, III, and IV, that we, there, there are parameters that we, that guide our decision-making around how the funds are used, but 
that, you know, that those monies, you know, are perfectly, you know, designed for this particular type of, of, you know, important need. I mean, and the other thing that I think, you know, um, we just, you know, maybe, to, you know, to keep in mind, you know, um, the, you know, the CDC on April uh, 8th declared racism as a serious public health threat. So, I, you know, that's, that, you know, that's an area that I think, you know, would, there is nothing else that's been declared a serious public health threat, you know, and, you know, except for this horrible virus, right? The, you know, the, the you know, COVID. Uh, so I think that, you know, hearing that pronouncement is also, you know, further fuels um, a sense that this is a clear priority for the district in terms of, you know, building capacity. You know, the, the, one of the things that Janice can't do when she's teaching both a courageous co uh, conversations course as well as uh, an English as a new language learner course, both different, both require preparation. Um, and, and she, you know, has leadership responsibilities. You know, the, she's the go to for both of the programs. Uh, she's ENL coordinator, you know, and, you know, it, it takes, you know, time for her to do those responsibilities. So it doesn't leave any time, you know, much time for her to do, you know, what she, she you know, dreams of doing and can do uh, if she was given the time. So this, the, the two years with the funds that we do have that don't, um, that, that won't, you know, require us to go into our reserves, you know, make the most sense, you know, and, and um, um uh, you know, I, you know, I, I can't imagine that we wouldn't take advantage of this opportunity. And so, Valerie, just so I'm clear, those can be used for salary and programs, those funds? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. And by when does that? And again, because it's a two-year commitment of funds, so, you know, those are, you know, you can't, you know, you're not going to be able to, you, you have to have a plan in year three. You know, with regards to, you know, what, you know, what, how, you know, if you don't want to go into your reserves, you know, how are you going to fund that, that, you know, this particular position beyond the expiration of the, you know, the American, uh, you know, uh, Rescue Plan uh, Act funds. There could be some more that comes afterwards, but you have two years, you know, that uh, of funding that, you know, you could utilize that, that prevent, you know, that doesn't require, that, that won't lead you into your reserves. By when does it need to be earmarked, the federal funds? Starting probably, I would say, um, you know, shortly, you know, we would have to start, you know, planning, you know, pulling people together to plan on, you know, what those, those, you know, activities and programs, um, you know, are actually going to be, because I'm sure there, there'll be a filing date, which there typically is. Uh, so um, I know Maureen has been attending webinars and so forth to understand all the logistics associated with, uh, you know, complying with the act, uh, but um, she'll be able to provide, uh, you know, some, some, some more details with regards to the filing dot, uh, deadline, which is really what will be important uh, moving forward in terms of uh, the board's decision around um, the use of the American Rescue Plan Act funds uh, for this position for two years. I mean, maybe we need to reconvene with Maureen when she, um, when we can to better understand, you know, what those monies can be allocated for, what they can't be. This is separate from really the budget, right? Because this is a separate funding. Um, exactly. We need to understand more. Also, what are all what are all the areas that the money go could go towards, right? Sure. Just and the board can adopt the budget and, you know, you, you know, you can make the decision to go ahead and adopt. You don't need to delay that and then make a decision, you know, since we've not made any decisions about any of those funds for this purpose as, as well as others. Allison, that's a, I don't know if that was exactly your point, but I mean, this is a budget that I can support. Maybe we should add three more psychologists. Maybe we should add two more special ed teachers. Maybe we can get a lot of that from rescue plans. Our country needs these sort of positions. Our school district has been adding these sort of positions. We don't need to evaluate it this year in a very atypical year. 
we are not in a position to know what has been successful, what hasn't been successful. This budget has some strong things, some weak things. We'll have some rescue money available. We can put it to things we don't understand yet. Which, I can find plenty of other topics to bring up and we can go till midnight. I want to adjust this budget. But 0.6 is a huge position compared to our peer districts. We have lots of priorities and they don't go against each other. We have funding issues. They don't stop anything going on. We have never discussed what we're gonna cut. Everything has just been add. Every solution is add. And Doug mentioned it. I hear from people who want a balance in how much we spend in our district. So we can add, we can say yes to everything. Yes to a bigger hillside. Yes to more aids. Yes to more special education focus. Yes to more administrators. And yes to a bigger increased focus on DEI issues for our students. Our country is horribly failing in many ways. I'm not sure if our district has reached its full potential from our just recent creation and increase of this position. Let's see where our teachers go. Let's see where our curriculum goes. We have new influences coming. This doesn't have to be the biggest item going on right now. It is for our country, for this decade, this generation, this half century. And we're lucky to be in a district that has prioritized our needs for all of our students. I'm not interested in cutting anybody off, but I, have, I am cognizant of the fact that we've been, we spent a good deal of amount time in terms of this discussion. So I would just ask our trustees that if anybody has any final remarks, we kind of wrap it up so that we can proceed with the remaining items on our agenda. Well, I just want to make sure that I'm clear. Um, is there, it sounds Valerie, like you're saying, uh, we could vote on the current budget and also get this money and change an approach to the things that would impact it, one of which is diversity uh, and inclusion position. Is that correct? That's correct. So you can vote on your annual budget for the 2021-2022 school year um, in the amount of $52,823,911. Um, and, um, and then make us a different, you know, have a different conversation about the American Rescue Plan Act funds. But Valerie, are you saying that for sure that there would be enough money and, and it would be um, applicable in this case to, to cover the extra, let's say approximately 50 grand a year for two years? Um, the last, uh, um, the last, I think, accounting of them of those funds was about, you know, um, a, a little over a million, like I shouldn't say a little over, it could have been 1.3 or $1.4 million. Um, you know, of course, you know, over the, over, uh, you know, using, you know, utilized over the course of two years. And uh, uh, since, it, since the funds operate the way that our current, uh, as I said, federal funds operate, we have to, you know, earmark or specify how we're using them and salary equipment, you know, um, you know, consultants, all the sort of like, you know, there are five categories that that these funds, you know, uh, uh, you know, can be used around and, um, you know, certainly salaries are part of that construct. Thank you. Sorry, last question. Is it sort of a use it or lose it situation or could it um, because I'm just, I'm thinking about some of the recent proposals I did see from the diversity work that's being done. And a large part of it was having um, professional development, which we pay for, for Dr. Um, Price Dennis. 
um, to come and work with the English and history departments, which he started to do, but um, that's professional development that is in the budget, but I'm sure we would like to expand as well. So, you know, to look into whether or not it could be earmarked for that, you know, over the next couple of years or even expanding for next year or something like that. That would, that would be an appro another appropriate use of the funds. Professional learning is definitely part of, um, you know, allowable usage for those funds. So it's a matter of looking at what we have because what, you know, what, you know, federal funds allow districts to do is to offset their general budget. So, you know, there are things that are in the general budget that can come out and be paid for by these federal funds. So that looking at the increase in the diversity coordinator position, you know, is the same function as, you know, obviously the, 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 the you know, the, the caution is that, as I said, we, we have, you have two years, you know, for those funds, you know, so you have two years to cover the position and then you are back to this conversation, you know, with regards to what do you do moving forward in year three. And just so people listening know, we do fall about $1.2 million short a year without adding anything. That's just the rollover for healthcare and salaries and those sorts of things. So anyway. Okay. Does everybody feel like they've gotten their perspective? No, you know, you know, I'm not done, but I'm no, I just, I forgot to mention I'm going to yank you out then forcibly. You can. I just, uh, <laughs> there were, we keep forgetting uh, as a Zoob webinar, the people watching have no ability to know how uh, large the crowd is. So there are 10 panelists and 43 attendees right now in this discussion. This has been something we've been hearing about from a lot, but we have had people asking to, to update them on that. Okay. So I would feel comfortable voting for this budget if we could agree that we would commit money from the uh, the federal money, forgetting what it's called, the rescue plan to making the position to cover the difference between a 0.6 to a 1.0. I, I just, I'd kind of like to talk to Janice and Melissa and others directly involved once we find out how the funds can be used. I, I kind of want to check with them to see where they think they would best be spent for the next year or two. I, I, I of course, I agree with the idea of the position and uh, I'm a supporter of Janice's. Um, right. I, I just, I would like to be able to check with them since we just learned this information and say, given the goals that you've laid out for us so far, how do you, what do you and the groups you're affiliated with think is the best use of this money. I, I just am uncomfortable making that commitment before I, I they weigh in. Mm -hmm. We can have them present. I mean, you know, Janice has presented before. So I think to have, you know, Janice come forth and present at one of the next meetings, if not the March 4th, um, uh, the, the, you know, the, you know the, the one after that, uh, that would make the most sense. And in that way, you know, the ideas that you know, she certainly, you know, has been sharing with Melissa and, you know, Melissa, she and Melissa have, uh, you know, ongoing conversations, uh, as well as, you know, uh, the diversity committee, um, you know, that it would make sense, you know, for, for everyone to hear this presentation and, and um, you know, and, and understand, you know, how, you know, um, you know, how moving forward, um, these particular initiatives are going to be, you know, sort of evaluated. So how do we know, as, you know, to Doug's point, that you know these efforts are actually making a difference in the in the in this you know in the in the school community. So I think that would be you know productive in terms of of, of uh, the presentation as well. Yeah, I, I would be in support of that. Okay, so I'm going to ask the question: Do I have a motion to approve item three A? the adoption of the 2021-2022 school budget. So moved. Second. Second. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed say this, no. Th this is a, 
this is a, agreeing to what we just talked about. Is that? Was agreeing to the I don't budget. know what we're agreeing to. The, we're adopting the current budget. Without any commitment to the other money. It's, it's a different, yeah. We said that we're committed to it, but that's not this vote. Sylvia, can you read the motion again? I think we're voting on the budget that we yes, have been I, presented. Do I have a motion to approve item 3A, the adoption of the 2021-2022 school budget? And that's the, that is the presentation that is actually contained there in tonight's agenda. And that's, yes, and it's been uh, so moved and seconded. Yes. So thank you. So all in favor, say is, aye. Is, I'm just, is there an opportunity to uh, discuss this position further if we make this vote or? My it's understanding from what Valerie said earlier is that we could in fact move to adopt this, this budget as it currently is stated, even though it only has a diversity coordinator in a 0.6 position and later on, um, access funds to see whether or not they would be applicable to the work that we would want the diversity coordinator to take on. It would be something to contemplate, not to say that we're signing on the dotted line that we are affirming tonight that it will be expanded to that position. It just means that just because we adopt this particular budget that is before us, it doesn't, pro it doesn't preclude us from seeking that funding, that additional funding. But Valerie can speak to that more clearly than I. But the no, actual, I think that's- Go ahead. That's it, that, that, um, that we can, you know, whether it's the May 4th meeting and, and you know, Melissa and Janice can talk about whether they have enough time to prepare a presentation for that. And, and then also have a conversation with uh, Maureen about, you know, what portions of the funds do in fact, you know, apply to, uh, you, know, you know, other programming plus an increase in the, a, the F, you know, increase in, in the time um, uh, of the diversity coordinator. So that's a presentation. Uh, as I said, we will more than likely we can, we should be able to have to, to, to uh, make a pre or create a presentation for May, for May 4th. Uh, what do you think, Melissa? My only hesitation is that we are anticipating involving the voice of two departments in the collaborative design of some of the upcoming work. And those dates are happening. Um, I, you know, and of course, Dietra, Dr. Dietra Price Dennis has sent us a proposal for that. I was anticipating putting that forth on the May 4th agenda with the hope that the ELA department and social studies departments could be involved in the design process of, th of a few years of outcomes where we've included a lot more voice. So that would be my only hesitation because Janice and I work very closely together and we've recognized a need to pivot in some of our original planning. But in terms of a presentation with Janice around the work that she'd be doing in her position and then anything that you know that you're anticipating for next year, would you have enough time to pull together a presentation for May 4th, whether you are, you, you finalize specific things, but then just to make sure that the board has an opportunity to understand the, the range of, of activities that, that would be covered under a full-time um, diversity coordinator position, if you, you know, would you have enough time to, to do that on, um, on May 4th, for the May 4th board meeting? That seems like not a problem. She and I have already talked about potential responsibilities related with the role if we do the increase. And we've also done some backward design in terms of some, some drivers for the work. Okay, May 4th presentation. Thank you, Mel thank you. Are we gonna be adjusting any other parts of the budget on May 4th? Should we, uh, should we add other items that we should be looking at then too? I mean, as a board, is, uh, are we gonna open up the budget to uh, a whole other a lot of issues? Because I've uh, I've sort of thinned out my understanding of our timing. So April twentieth, we're putting out a budget for the people. That's what I understood where we're going. Should we keep opening this up on May fourth? Because I'd like to look back into busing. Then I'll have a. Jeremy, I think we're this just a budget um, item, we're going to find out from Maureen what kinds of things these monies can be can go for towards. 
and what would make sense since it's only a two year span, you know, I, in my mind, I'm seeing it as what would Janice, Melissa, the department chairs, what would they design for those monies over to a two year period, as well as where else do these monies, where else are they supposed to be going since we've just sort of, it's just come about that this is happening. We don't even know where the money can be allocated. So I don't, I, this is one area that we can learn about and the professional development that they are interested in as they've already noted that that's a part of their plan going forward. Just, so that's just one element that can be introduced. I also think, you know, Maureen can lay out for us, these are other areas that money could go towards. Um, I also think that, you know, Janice is at our meeting tonight. I'm, I know it's getting late, but I think if people had questions, I, I'm putting her on the spot, but she probably could answer questions about what it would mean to go from 0.6 to 1.0. I, I don't think that's a great use of time right now, Joe. Okay, that's fine. Just but I, I hear your concern, JG, and that you know it's the year after year over year budget you're concerned about beyond the two years. So you know that is something that we can talk about once we understand more these funds more thoroughly. All right, I'm going to take a stab at moving forward on our agenda. Are we all on the same in the same place? We feel comfortable with the vote we just cast. Okay. Do we cast a vote? Yes, but do you, should I, should I rerun the vote? What was the I vote? have the first and second, but I don't know um, who who said the eyes. All right, let's let's try it. Um, the third college try or whatever it is. All right. Do I have a motion to approve? Item 3A, the adoption of the 2021-2022 school budget. So moved. And do I have a second? Do I have a second? Second. Okay, second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. I'm saying aye, but with in good faith that we will go forward with this money that is ours to use for this position. I, I never want to oppose a budget and I never have in my 12 years of being on the board. And I am all for this district, but we have money available and I'm doing this in good faith that all of you will see that as valuable. I, I will just say that I think that all of us are acting and operating under good faith. I don't think that anybody is trying to do anything untoward. I think that we're just trying to get a resolution as to whether or not we can move forward with the business for tonight. And I think that the fact that we've dedicated an extensive amount of time to hearing from our community, from our board members, is indicative of the fact that we don't take any of these decisions lightly and don't in any way underestimate the contributions that our staff members make to our district. So um, I'm gonna move on to the next item which is, do we have any questions related to business items one through 12 listed in part 3B of our agenda? I'm not hearing any questions. So do I have a motion to approve business items one through 12 in part 3B of our agenda? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say no. The ayes have it and the motion is carried. Do we have any questions related to placement and or services for CSC and CPSC recommended in part 3C of our agenda? I'm not seeing an indication of any questions from anyone. So do I have a motion to approve the placement and or services for CSC and CPSC recommended in part 3C of our agenda? Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 The ayes have it, the motion is carried. We've now arrived at the personnel portion of our meeting. Do we have any questions related to appointments one through four listed in part 4A of our agenda? Uh, 
I don't see any indication from my colleagues that there are any questions or comments. So do I have a motion to approve appointments one through four in part 4A of our agenda? Do I, have a motion? Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, the ayes have it and the motion is carried. Do we have any, mo any questions related to amendments one through two listed in part 4B of our agenda? I'm not noting that there's any questions put forth by any of the board trustees. So do I have a motion to approve appointments one through two? Oh, I'm sorry, to approve amendments one through two in part 4B of our agenda. So moved. Is there a second? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it and the motion is carried. Do we have any questions related to leaves of absence one through seven listed in part 4C of our agenda? I don't know any questions coming forth from any of my board colleagues. So I'd like to ask if we have a motion to approve leaves of absence one through seven in part 4C of our agenda. Is there a second? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it and the motion is carried. Do we have any questions related to resignations one through three listed in part 4D of our agenda? Just a quick note to say, we're sorry to see Mr. DeCams go, that we wish him the best of luck. And we've been very, very lucky to have him. Um, and to thank Ms. De La Barrera also for um, coming in and hitting the ground running and really being on top of everything for, for us in multiple meetings and emails and the rest of it. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Melissa. And we're not losing you. We're just shifting, right? Which is great. Yeah. We're keeping part of you. First <laughs> are, she's a Melissa. Yes, exactly. There you go. Two Melissas mm -hmm. are sticking together on this one. <laughs> Exactly. I don't so, know the third name on that list, but everybody who works for our district, of course, uh, we appreciate the efforts you have done as a school monitor. So all three of you, but definitely the ones, Melissa, it's always good to have you with us. So do I have a motion to approve appoint, uh, resignations one through three in part 4D of our agenda? So moved. And do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, the ayes have it and the motion carries. We've now arrived at the minutes portion of our meeting. Do we have any questions related to approval of our minutes for our board meeting on April 7th, 2021? I don't note that any of my fellow trustees have indicated any questions with regards to the minutes. So do I have a motion to approve our minutes for our board meeting on April 7th, 2021? So moved. And do I have a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The ayes have it and the motion is carried. We've now arrived at the new business portion of our meeting. So for members of the public, please know that items 6A and 6B are voted upon by all boards of education as participants in the Southern Westchester Board of Cooperative Educational Services Consortium. With that said, do we have any questions related to the items in 6A and 6B in our agenda?
So do I have a motion to approve the items in 6A and 6B? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. The ayes have it and the motion is carried. And now we'll hear from Superintendent Henny Piedmont regarding item 6C, a proposed revision in the 2021-2022 school year calendar. Dr. Henny Piedmont. You're on mute. Going on. Um, there was um, a revision um, uh, proposed by the uh, Hastings Teachers Association um, as it pertains to the very last day of the school year in uh, 2022, uh, which is that June 25th date. Um, and the reason that that was added is that there, there's a, um, um, a, a dilemma around language that, um, that the state has prescribed in uh, section 175.5 as it pertains to how superintendent's conference days are counted and a parent-teacher conferences are considered parent, uh, uh, superintendent's conferences under section 175.5, which is the, the regulations that govern uh, how uh, uh, instructional time is counted. And, um, and, the, and language that is in the Hastings Teachers Association contract uh, that um, may not have, uh, that doesn't necessarily reflect or align to that, that regulation. So rather than um, you know disagreeing with that um, uh, you know in terms of you know trying to reconcile th those differences of opinion, um, I went ahead and and made that last day uh, June 25th a superintendent's conference day, um, uh, and uh, you know if for some reason as the the state aid calendar you mean, is you mean June 24th right. June uh, in 2022, it's June 24th. It's a Friday. That's the very last day of school. So that day, that day will be a superintendent's conference day. That's the new change. There was no other change to the calendar. So nothing, nothing changed from August until uh, that very last day of June 24th. Um, and so if for some reason in, you know, once uh, the conversation, my recommendation is that, the, uh, uh, you know, the that the Hastings Teachers Association and you know the inter the interim superintendent um, uh, Maureen Carballo um, and Melissa Szymanski um, meet to discuss you know the, the you know the the regulatory language under Section 175.5 and uh, the contract language to sort of try to come to some common ground around you know what it actually means and you know in calculating how many superintendents conference days. Uh, are actually in the calendar. So um, that's that's the proposal is to um, go with the June 25th and then in the coming year, um, the, you know, there, the, the conversation should pick up uh, and there should be some discussion about the, the regulatory language and the, uh, the, the language uh, pertaining to the calendar in the Hastings Teachers uh, Association uh, contract. Could the number of school days be uh, reduced then to 181 school days? It still says 182 school days on it. Are we taking away a school day there at the last day of the year? That day is considered a, uh, a superintendent's conference day, so it counts towards the instructional days. So it's not a loss of, of, of instruction. Um, but as I said, the, 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 the place that needs clarification is around how the half parent teacher conference days are counted uh, um, uh, in relationship to a you know, half instructional day. So there's a difference in opinion on, on that. And as I said, it's best to go into the new year in resolving that um, and, and um, you know, coming to some decision around what exactly you know, that means. Uh, as it pertains to, you know, the bargaining unit's interpretation and the, the actual language of um, the regulations. Traditionally, it's been June 25th. So in the 2019-2020 calendar, uh, which, um, you know, was developed before I started, June 25th was a superintendent's conference day. I mean, the last day of school, which is called rating day. 
it was a superintendent's conference day. So that isn't different from some, you know, from, from the past. Thank you. So now that we've heard an explanation of the proposed change, do we have any additional questions related to the proposed revision in the 2021-2022 school year calendar? Sure, I'm gonna repeat myself just to stretch the meeting longer. Um, I still have concerns about this calendar. I was uh, previously have uh, suggested we move the March Superintendent's Conference Day to the last day of the school year. I'm concerned that we have the fewest number of school days before the AP tests and the state tests compared to other districts. I'm concerned that we're the only Rivertown district taking six days off for what is in a, inappropriately known as Easter break, and it's not Easter break. We are taking six days. Every other school district next to us is taking five. There are ways that we can make a calendar more student friendly instead of bringing our students back before Labor Day. Those days are not strong instructional days. Our calendar should be revised. And I like the way uh, Valerie presented this need on a superintendent's day. It's probably already satisfies our contract as is, whether or not we pursue that with the uh, interim superintendent. We had the right amount of superintendent days. We have options on where we place these days to get more effective instructional days for students. I'm, uh, I'm gonna vote no against uh, this budget just because I don't wanna ever be on record uh, with this uh, revision. You said budget or calendar, I'm sorry. I meant calendar and thank okay. you both. Just I'm to gonna vote sure. no on this calendar. This is not uh, a student focused calendar. Dobbs, mm -hmm. Irvington and Ardsley have a better version of a student focused calendar. We should revise our calendar and adjust our calendar. I hear you, Jeremy, and I think maybe next year, uh, you, I know you're gonna vote no, but you also have to take in mind that the teachers are actually in support of coming back before Labor Day. Which no, I that's, I don't think that's accurate. The teachers have written to us, they say they have no objections to the calendar. The teachers are going to come back before Labor Day. We are putting three school days for students. The teachers would always have to come back before Labor Day. Right. There are three school days breaking up traditional summer. This is the year of a atypical summer. Why we'd want to bring our kids back before Labor Day and not give them student days in March, April, and May. Why are we being a unicorn on this issue? We are a unicorn on DEI, which is a benefit to our leadership. We have no reasoning that I have been convinced of why we are gonna push three school days instead of moving that March date to June like it's already is happening. This is a very strange calendar that continues to get majority support from this board. So my question is, Valerie, or I guess it's Val, um, by what time, by when do we need to approve a calendar? Well, people have actually approved their calendars. I think, you know, if you go into another revision of it, you're probably going to have people who have already been making plans around this calendar when it was adopted uh, in March, um, you know, the, the, la the adoption of, um, of March uh, 10th. So uh, I would worry about uh, going, you know, going back and revising it when people have already begun to take to make plans around this calendar. There are quite a few school districts that haven't uh, even proposed their calendars yet. But yes, one of the changes that have been made when we approve this calendar is our River Arts community dropped a whole week from their programming. They went from a five week summer offering for the river arts to a four week. And they did that solely because of the Hastings calendar. 
They would have done five weeks based on Dobbs, Irvington, and Ardsley, and they've made changes. But I bet uh, a lot of people would uh, be able to adjust their calendars. Should, should we vote at this point? I mean, we can talk about I, the I calendar. Just, I just wanted to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to speak. The item before us is item 6C. So do I have a motion to approve item 6C? So moved. Do I have a second? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say no. No. The ayes have it and the motion is carried. So we've now arrived at the old business portion of our meeting. And what we have before us tonight is a second reading of district policies 150, 310, 320, 100, and 8,500. Um, would Dr. Henning Piedmont or members of the policy committee care to share anything to take into consideration about these varied policies? Sylvia, can you check? Did we just skip uh, did community? Just, we did. Yeah. I'm sorry. What did I skip? Uh, D. D. Six, uh, it was D. Uh, D. Oh, let me go back. Thank you. Hold on one second. Six. Why don't I have 60 on my... It doesn't seem I have 60 on hold on one second. It's community feedback about reducing physical distance in classrooms. Oh, I don't think I have that in mind. Hold on. Yeah, one you probably, if you printed it, it, it came in a little late. Um, oh, okay. So I don't have that before me. I apologize for not having um, mentioned that before. It was not an intentional oversight. So the topic before us then is community feedback about reducing physical distance in classrooms. And I will leave it to Dr. Henning Piedmont to take it away. Thank you so much. Um, so um, as you know, um, as part of the uh, April 8th, New York State Department of Health uh, guidelines that were released late after districts had already made plans around you know, how to operationalize all in-person learning, uh, part of that, uh, part of the requirements uh, in that guidance uh, indicates that we should gain uh, community feedback uh, with regards to whether or not um, uh, we would reduce our physical distance from six to three feet. So um, I administered a survey and um, received some feedback. And so I wanted to share that with the board tonight. It doesn't require a, a vote on anything like the school reopening plan was not a vote, but this is uh, following the guidance with regards to sharing the feedback uh, and also just indicating where we are with regards to our compliance with this uh, New York State uh, Department of Health guidance that was released late on April 8th. Um, I'm, I just have a couple of slides uh, that I'll, are, I'll share. Uh, so I'll just um, share my screen, just one second. So with regards to just where we are now, when we shifted from the hybrid model to the all-in-person learning model, the, the sort of foundation that you know built that or led us to the all-in-person model had to do with uh, making sure that you know we either maintain six feet of physical distance in classrooms between students or we use barriers. So that's how we opened our you know first day of all-in-person learning on April 12th before the uh, April 8th, uh, late Friday guidance from New York State uh, was released, which you know, contradicts this. So in our current all-in-person learning model, we, are, uh, we use the six feet of physical distance or the use of a barrier. Um, in the majority of our classrooms, we uh, are using barriers, either desktop barriers or floor barriers, and sometimes it's a combination of both. Uh, masks, uh, as we know, are mandatory. Uh, there hasn't been any change. The only difference is, not even a difference, but the only time the mask is not worn by a child is when uh, he or she is eating. Um, frequent hand washing is still emphasized. Uh, physical distance uh, in, you know, outside of classrooms is, is emphasized. Uh, the guidance document did, in fact, reduce the amount of, of uh, the, the, the physical distance uh, between students when it comes to 
uh, being, you know, uh, to to uh, performances, uh, any place, you know, in uh, physical education. Um, so uh, where had where the physical distance had been 12, it was reduced to six. Um, it references to six feet in all directions when it comes to um, uh, singing or participating in physical education. So um, and obviously, as I said, the uh, the, the um, the, one of the sort of critical areas that we uh, are paying attention to is making sure, you know, in our cafeteria or in places where children are eating in classrooms, and it has to be six feet of physical distance when masks are not worn. And the other requirement that we're paying close attention to in the all-in-person uh, learning model uh, is the uh, adherence to the, uh, the COVID health questionnaire and hoping that parents, you know, take it very seriously because it, um, you know, if a, uh, if a child comes to school um, not feeling well, it could lead to uh, actually what happened the first week, which is we did have a case and, and then we had a case this week as well. So we really need, you know, just the baseline requirements, you know, and, and uh, guidelines that we are currently using to, you know, to, to maintain to, to maintain our ability to, to function in the all in person learning model. So one part of the uh, New York State uh, Department of Health guidance is, does, you know, sort of uh, look at this issue of community risk tolerance. So uh, feedback, the feedback from the community, you know, is really to assess our, our tolerance with regards to, you know, whether we can move, you know, from six feet or whether there's a belief, you know, that we can safely move from six feet to three feet. Now, of course, as I mentioned earlier on the er earlier slide, we're not in, you know, we, we, you know, we don't maintain six feet, you know, of physical distance uh, in our classrooms, in the majority of our classrooms. So we're at the use of barriers, you know, to to meet this, you know, expectation. So the other um, sort of new part of this New York State uh, Department of Health guidance is that it's um, reduction of six feet to three feet without the barriers. So that's pretty significant. We could not operate, you know, most districts in the state in the state could not operate if we had to, uh, you know, go with uh, even six feet without barriers or three feet without barriers. We wouldn't be in uh, the all in all in person learning model. So the, the guidance, uh, I think most people have seen uh, from the New York State Department of Health, you know, all of our, you know, all of my colleagues and all of the districts and superintendents have certainly been thinking a lot and trying to make sure that, you know, we can still remain all in because the last thing any of us want to do is to roll back to being in the hybrid model. So, you know, we've been working very closely with the Westchester County Department of Health, as well as our, uh, our county executive, uh, George Latimer, to to make sure that we are, you know, adhering, but that, you know, we're not rolling back to, you know, the hybrid model. So the survey, uh, which was just a few questions, there's three questions that, that were asked, um, you know, first and foremost identified, you know, who participated overwhelmingly, you know, the green, 86.4% uh, of the participants, the 485 responses to the survey were from parents. Um, and the next uh, highest 11.1 were for teachers, and you see the other groups, staff, administrators, and community members. Um, in terms of the question about reducing from six feet of physical distance to three, um, the, the 474 responses uh, show that 69.2% agree that that should occur, that we should you know, move from six to three feet and 30.8% uh, indicate that uh, disagree with that notion of moving from six feet of physical distance to three feet. And this pertains to children in classrooms. The staff, faculty are still expected to be um, within, you know, uh, follow the guidelines of six feet between themselves and students. So this uh, six to three uh, pertains to children. In terms of sort of the overall, uh, you know, summary of thoughts with regards to reducing from six feet to three feet without barriers in classrooms, uh, you know, reflect, you know, the following, uh, you know, concerns. A majority of the respondents agreed we should remove the barriers altogether. Um, some stated that we should only remove barriers if six feet of physical distance was maintained. Uh, some stated we should keep the barriers to remind children to be cautious and to watch their distance in class. Uh, some mentioned we should keep the barriers at least through the end of the school year, this school year. And then some stated uh, the barriers are not a bad idea in classrooms filled with children. In terms of uh, the monitoring of the transmission of, of, of COVID, uh, which is another component of the New York State Department of Health guidelines, 
Uh, there are three mechanisms that school districts, you know, can look at. First, the, the first is the CDC COVID tracker, which it really looks at, you know, Westchester County. So if you looked at Westchester County in the COVID uh, tracker, you'd see that it and many other counties in the state of New York are in the red zone. The red zone uh, is the most you know, the sort of the, the the highest risk of transmission in those counties. So every county in the state of New York, it, it, you know, if you just look at the counties are, are, are represented in the red in terms of being at the highest level of risk. If you look at the COVID school report card, each school district has one. Um, and uh, in addition, the Westchester County uh, active COVID cases, you'll get some more you know, information that's more pertinent to Hastings. So for example, if you looked at the COVID school uh, report card, which you know we contribute to, so every day information is added to this report card. Since we started um, um, sharing this information with the New York State Department of Health, and that would, would have, that goes back to September 8th, uh, only 17 cases, positive cases, have been recorded at Farragut, six at Hastings High School. And this is from September 8th to um, uh, April 19th. Um, and at Hillside, nine uh, positive cases were recorded. Uh, right now, as of uh, April 19th in Hastings, there are 14 active cases of COVID. And then in the county, there, uh, the county's positive uh, percentage of positive cases is 4.9. So there is no, no uh, specific transmission rate uh, that, that we can look at or reference with regards to the local Hastings transmission rate of COVID. Uh, but the other indicators, meaning our own reporting, so we also track you know, students who, are, uh, who, happen to uh, who go into quarantine after being exposed to a positive uh, case and, uh, and monitor whether those children, any of those children are actually you know, actually contracted the, the virus. So that's an important, you know, piece of information which, which with, with regards to uh, keeping track of transmission, transmission rate. Um, the other sort of step moving forward is that uh, we can remove the desk barriers in elementary classrooms only if three feet of physical distance can be maintained. We can remove uh, the barriers in middle and high school classrooms only if six feet of physical distance can be maintained. Uh, we can make sure there is six feet of physical distance between children when they remove their mask to eat and then continue. Um, and this is something that the superintendents in uh, the Westchester region do uh, continue to have uh, weekly meetings with the Westchester County Department of Health and our county executive Latimer to assess uh, our risk factors. Um, you know, uh, we are sure that they are standing behind the districts, uh, which is why we're, you know, stay, you know, we remain open in the all in uh, learning model rather than retreating to the hybrid model uh, because they are aware of uh, our activities and, and what we're doing, what we did to, you know, to move from or shift from the hybrid model to the all in person model learning model and they recognize that we're doing so safely and that this week, our weekly check-ins with the Westchester County Department of Health and our County Executive uh, Latimer is sort of assurance that, you know, uh, we're not doing something that's going to place uh, any of our, our uh, students or faculty and staff at risk. So that's where we are at this point in, you know, following, uh, you know, the guidance that, um, uh, that is laid out in the New York State Department of Health um, um, you know, document as well as uh, looking at our current practices that we put into place before this guidance was released. Um, so uh, at this point, as I stated, you know, the only way that we could, you know, uh, you know, move from, you know, six feet to three feet would only be in those elementary classrooms where they're, they actually are three feet apart. Uh, obviously, mask wearing is a mandatory, goes without saying, but at the secondary level, you know, even at six feet, we don't we don't have six feet of physical distance in any of our classes that would allow us to take down the barriers. So we can't do that. You know, as much as I think, you know, you know that would be, a, you know, a great, you know, sort of, you know, outcome of this. It isn't. You know, the guidance, you know, actually ended up being more restrictive for districts. You know, uh, in the end, uh, we ended up, you know, needing to really consider, you know, are some of these things practices that are that put place us in jeopardy. Um, and, um, you know, as long as we, we, you know, we keep, you know, we stay where we are that got us to the all in person learning model, um, keep those barriers in place because we would not be able to operate 
Uh, if we did, in fact, remove them, we would be out of compliance. And I think that would be, you know, a pretty significant, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, safety risk by doing that. Um, so uh, where we are now, we should remain and, and, and make sure, as we have been doing, follow all the guidance uh, with regards to, um, you know, making sure that um, we operate safely uh, and that, you know, while those partitions, you know, are, you know, the CDC, you know, certainly shared, you know, their, you know, the science behind the, the partitions, um, I do agree with those family members who indicated that it's, it's at least something to remind children to be cautious about, you know, when they're in class. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and if for some reason, you know, there's, there's a way to have six feet of physical distance in our secondary classrooms and then we can take down the barriers, uh, I think that, you know, we certainly will look at that. But, you know, a lot of us walked around, uh, you know, Miss um, Szymanski and I walked around in the first day at the second, at, at both uh, um, Farragut and the high school. There is no way to take down those barriers and be able to function in the all-in-person learning model. So we have to you know, sort of stay where we are and keep, you know, moving forward. And as I said, really I'm relying upon parents to take the, you know, continue to take the COVID health screener seriously so that, um, you know, uh, children can, you know, uh, you know, if, if, they, if they have any symptoms, they stay home rather than coming to school um, and then, you know, ending up, uh, you know, uh, exposing others and mainly their classmates. Um, and those classmates could, you know, during their quarantine period, end up contracting, you know, the virus, um, or testing positive for the virus. So, uh, and then of course that, that leads to, as I said, um, an examination of the transmission rate uh, from positive cases that we know of in the school uh, in, or in our schools. So um, that's where we are at this point in terms of, you know, how the, the guidance, um, the newest guidance has influenced our thinking and what's, you know, basically what we're, you know, we're keeping in place that allows us to remain in the all-in-person learning model, which is really important, I think, for all of us. And I, you know, I, you know, we we did we knew we were going to go into when we opened in all in the all-in-person learning model that, you know, there were going to be, uh, you know, someone someone was going to test positive, and then that was going to lead to some quarantines. We knew that, you know, no one you know, thought that that was not going to happen. What, you know, the benefit uh, in terms of the vaccinations and people who are full, or have been fully vaccinated is that there's immunity for, for the adults and uh, that, you know, who, who have, you know, are two weeks out of, you know, two weeks away from their second dose uh, of the vaccine. Uh, and that's been very helpful because then it keeps us open and those adults who who, who might have come in contact with a positive student don't have to be quarantined, you know, that, you know, they're safe and, and immune. So that's where we are. And, um, and we'll, and hopefully we'll stay in school um, through the duration of the school year and be engaged in a lot of the really important activities that our students, uh, you know, have loved up and, and look forward to participating in. So thank you. Do I have any comments or questions from board trustees? I'm, uh, I'm uh, happy to see that Hillside instruction can try to proceed without the barriers. And uh, Valerie did explain some of the uh, difficulties or challenges in following uh, the state guidelines, what's not clear, or what we don't have. But what is clear is that barriers are not recommended for mitigation. What is clear is that barriers are a detriment to our classroom learning environment. And what is clear is that a majority of our parents, although we don't know at what grade levels, are ready to have their children sit at three feet and a majority are willing to do so without barriers. So what's not clear is why we are holding it. Maybe, I mean, the word cohorting, maybe the positive cases, it's a really tough one to uh, see. The barriers are making teaching and learning difficult. So when the experts say they do not help in mitigation, they didn't say that. I got to take that back. They said they do not recommend using them. 
can we consider adding fifth grade to that list? Fifth grade is cohorted. They're in their classrooms. The kids in the back of the room are looking at reflections and they can't hear anything. And anything we do that risks uh, another quarantined 40 students is a huge concern. I am uh, willing to follow administrators' decisions at every level for the rest of this year. And it's uh, disheartening to see that we can't uh, remove them yet, but some reasons were given. I just really, uh, really want us to push the envelope on this one. Barriers are not mitigation strategies that are recommended anymore, and barriers are blocking the hearing and the vision of our in-person students. Could we get an update? Are we at 80% again in person? Are we, uh, is this a very popular hybrid model once again? And thank you for the uh, presentation, I mean, Valerie. Yeah, we have, I mean, um, you know, our, our attendance um, uh, has been, you know, incredible since we, we returned all students. So for example, at, um, at Hillside, uh, Hillside has always been high, there are only 17 children learning remotely, so 523 reported today. Uh, at Farragut, 463 students reported, so 40 are learning at home. And at the high school, 432 reported, and so 83 are learning you know, um, from home. So um, that's a pretty significant you know, um, number of children who are in here. And I think the challenge, Jeremy, is that, you know, not having, not being able to have six feet of physical distance in the middle school, you know, or the high school, you know, uh, you know, that's an, that's, that's the dicey area, you know, when it comes to re now removing the barriers. I mean, you know, it's, you know, while they're, while you're, you know, while you're absolutely right, the, 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 the guidance says the CDC no longer recommends physical barriers for mitigation where physical distancing cannot be maintained. It doesn't say that they're danger and they should be removed. I mean, so, you know, I'm looking at the guidance and I, I know that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't state that, but yeah, it's better that it's ventilation, it's airflow and all those things we took care of, you know, with the, you know, the PTSA's fundraiser to, you know, make sure that there was a filter, an air, fil fil you know, air filtration system in each classroom, plus, you know, the one that we have, you know, for HVAC, as well as the windows and the doors. So all of that is happening. And now we have great, beautiful weather. You see a lot of children outside. So, you know, that's a good thing. You know, it, it would be challenging. I think, I think we would have, uh, you know, some, you know, um, the, you know, we would get concerns again, you know, from, you know, from a lot of people if we took, if we took all those barriers down. Because I do think, I agree with the parents who, who, writ, who shared in the survey, that it just, you know, it, it operates as a cautious, you know, as, as a cautionary kind of device, you know, to, to make sure that children are, you know, as they are sitting in their classrooms. And unfortunately, you know, the only children who are fully cohorted, you know, who are with one group of children all day long for the, you know, for the time that they're here in the building are the elementary age children. So cohorting, you know, doesn't work with secondary children because they are moving, you know, throughout the building, you know, from class to class. And, you know, if any of the children who are, are learning remotely come back in, that throws off that definition of children who are, who are not with, you know, in that particular class, you know, for the whole year. Uh, you know, that, that they're introduced to that mixture. So, you know, the cohorting component is really, unfortunately, not in, you know, doesn't serve the secondary students, you know, as well as it, it could, you know, as it serves the elementary children. Um, and, you know, and, I, and we've gotten this far, and I think that, you know, you'll see, you know, in places where, again, we can't, you know, at the elementary level where they can be three feet apart, you know, they can remove the barriers. That's great. You know, and I think you'll see, you know, um, at the secondary level where they can push, you know, find six feet. I'm, I'm not sure. In some of the classrooms I visited, I doubt very seriously they're going to find six feet of physical distance between the children. But I can tell you that, you know, as much as we'd all love to see them not have the, ba the barriers, it's great to see them in the building and hear them, you know, and, 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 and hear them, you know, uh, laughing and having, enjoying seeing each other. So that's the trade-off. If I, if it's barriers, and you know, or you know, or you know, 
noise from children, happy noise from children. I want to go for the happy noise from children. And they make, they're making plenty of happy noises, I can tell you. Well, maybe. And some other change could happen. I mean, the change has been coming, you know, so I'm hopeful that something will happen that will clarify some of this. You know, I, you know, I'm, you know, none of us like to see the barriers, you know, it isn't, you know, none of us feel great about that, but we need them, you know, we need, we need them to, you know, just make sure that it is sort of a, a you know, a, a way to kind of have some space where children, you know, if they're, coughing, you know, their sneeze guards, you know, if they're, you know, if there's, you know, you know, that that is at least one mechanism to protect the child in front of you um, and, you know, and the child behind you. So I, I don't think they are, you know, totally a waste of, of time. Well, maybe it's just something we can revisit shortly, you know, if people are wearing their masks consistently and the New York Department of Health continues to be clear about not recommending them, you know, maybe we can revisit it. Yeah, it's the, it's the physical distance component because that is, you know, for, for the vast majority of school districts, there's no way they can have all children back in classrooms and have and, you know, and, and maintain six feet of physical distance or three feet. But our Westchester County Department of Health and our uh, County Executive Latimer is willing to support schools and districts that are in this predicament, you know, because they, you know, can't meet the, the you know, the more stringent guidelines that, that, that are outlined here that are really are designed to keep us in the hybrid model rather than to keep you know to move us into the all in learning model but certainly you know honoring safety and making sure that you know we you know there's a you know we you know we're doing everything possible to mitigate the spread of, of the, the transmission of of the virus i would say based upon what i shared with you from the you know you know from the beginning of the school year in september you know 17 positive cases at Farragut since September 8th, six positive cases, Hastings High School, and nine positive cases at Hillside. I think that's pretty good. You know, there's a lot of quarantining that went along with that, though. A lot of quarantining. That's what that was. That's that's where the challenge is. And that was pre vaccinations. And so, you know, I think that, you know, we, you know, as long as we monitor that, we monitor, as I said, the, the current cases you know, of, of children who are out, you know, in, on quarantine and whether they, you know, they contract the virus, that, that, that's going to tell us a lot. Thank you, Dr. Henny Piedmont, for that status update of where we are. So I'm going to now go ahead and proceed to the old business portion of our meeting and uh, the aforementioned policy review that I mistakenly brought up a little bit too early. So I was wondering if Dr. Henning Piedmont or any other member of the policy committee would care to share anything that we should take into consideration about any of the policies that we're revisiting tonight. So this is the second read of the policies that the policy committee put forth. So um, uh, the uh, human, the, the, the HIV related policy has to do with you know, making sure that information about uh, anyone with HIV is confidential and that process is, we already adhere to that process. Um, any information, any HIV related information is not kept in one's personnel file, which is one of the, one of the, the requirements uh, that we not have. Uh, and, and, and that's clear that we, we're not, we don't have, we have two sets of places where this information is, is kept and only specific people need to know about this. Um, that so that's uh, the uh, policy uh, 0150, and the modification was recommended by our uh, legal counsel. Uh, policy 0310 is the board self evaluation. So the language that was added there indicated that it would occur um, before the uh, reorganization meeting, the annual reorganization meeting, and the board, you know, would have the option of using a a digital system so that um, they can, you know, that, um, you know, board members who might not uh, have been on the board can also go back and be able to see, you know, um, uh, any uh, self-evaluations that were done previously uh, and they're, they're archived for future, you know, reference. 
policy 0320 is the evaluation of superintendents. So at the suggestion of council, uh, language was added. September was the date by which uh, the uh, evaluation would need to be uh, completed, uh, finalized, and that language was added. Um, and uh, as I indicated, when we reviewed it, uh, that's also a conversation between the super, between the board and the superintendent relative to, you know, when the various evaluations, whether it's a mid-year evaluation uh, for feedback or the final evaluation, that's all worked out uh, between the board and the superintendent. Uh, the equal opportunity and non-discrimination uh, policy, um, uh, again, that, that, that was uh, an update at the recommendation of legal counsel um, and uh, policy 8500, school food uh, service program, uh, really addressed this notion of food shaming um, by having separate meal for, for children whose accounts um, were, you know, di you, know, uh, you know, didn't have any funds on them that would allow them to purchase you know, snacks and other food uh, so that, you know, we've never followed a shaming, you know, we've never had shaming practices here. So, um, you know, Maureen is really taking care of that. And, uh, and, and that, um, you know, we added that language just so that it's noted that, that, you know, when a child gets up to the register and, the, and, the, and the, it's determined the child doesn't have any money on their account, um, you know, that food won't be taken off of the child's tray or and the child won't be given a, an alternative that the child will get what other students get. Um, and policy 010, equal opportunity and non-discrimination. Again, you know, language that needed to be updated uh, as per uh, legal counsel. So those, this is the second read, the final read of the policies unless, of these particular policies, uh, unless um, there, there's a question that we can, uh, we can answer. So having heard Dr. Henning Piedmont's explanation of these various policies, uh, do we have any questions regarding the adoption of item 7A? I don't see any indication from any of the trustees that there's any questions regarding these items. So do I have a motion to approve item 7A? Is there a second? Is there a second? All right, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed, please say no. I believe we have, the ayes have it and the motion carries. All right, um, we've now arrived at the second public comment portion of our meeting. Members of the public are reminded to please state your name and limit your comments to two minutes. Thank you. Kate Janowski Rose. Sorry, is it backwards? No, it's okay. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm I'm very cognizant of the time. Um, uh, I, I want to thank and congratulate the administration and the district on a successful all-in reopening Herculean truly. Um, the budget may be done. Nevertheless, I would like to go on the record in favor of Amy Kays' request for an additional 0.2 of math support at Hillside. Mrs. Kays has presented her proposed budget a few weeks ago and explained that because of the COVID slide uh, and other needs, our elementary students need additional math support to be taught math. Tonight, our board spoke about identifying the needs of our district. Our elementary school principal has identified a need for increased math support. Candidly, my own children have not been identified as needing mass support at this time, but I would speak on, I would speak for those who have and will not receive that support. I think we all lose sleep over the COVID slide, not just for children in our own district, but all of us here worry about children all over the world, some of whom will never make up for the educational gap this pandemic has caused. $20,000 to teach more kids struggling with the fundamentals of math here in Hastings on Hudson is a priority. As a taxpayer, it is my priority that every child in Hastings learn math. As a taxpayer, it is my priority that every child in Hastings be an absolute rock star in elementary math and have the tools to succeed in any higher level subject they might choose to pursue. So are the elementary education needs of every, math, of every student being met here in Hastings? And please consider this for all future budgets and years to come. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, I don't see any more hands raised for public comment. Sorry, didn't unmute myself. So that means we've now arrived at the Board of Education comment portion of our meeting. So I'll open it up to my colleagues for any thoughts they'd like to share. We suddenly all become shy. So I'm then going to move over to the final portion of our meeting, which, which is the adjournment. Do I have a motion to adjourn our meeting for April 20th, 2021? Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Good night. Thank everyone. you, Sylvia. All right. Thank you. Good night.